Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to OTVJ's third lecture. And today we're going to be talking about some of the most common upper extremity conditions. Uh, we're going to have several videos on this. So each week I'm just going to talk about five different conditions. The first condition we're going to talk about is the skier's thumb. The skier's thumb is an ulnar collateral ligament injury of the thumb. And the purpose of the UCL is just to keep the thumb stable so the thumb is able to pinch objects. Skier's thumb is also known as the gamekeeper's thumb, but the difference is that in a gamekeeper's thumb, the injury is chronic, whereas in skier's thumb, it's acute. The ulnar collateral ligament can also be injured if the thumb is forced into abduction or hyperextension as due to playing the variety of rough contact sports. Some of the symptoms with skier's thumb is that you can see pain in the wrist, pain at the base of the thumb, which gets worse as you move it. There's also a lot of swelling at the thumb. And functionally, you're going to lose the ability to pinch between the thumb and index finger. This, you'll also see tenderness along the ulnar aspect of the thumb, as well as some discoloration of the skin as due to the injury, right? So in the acute stage of healing. So how does skier's thumb affect occupational performance? Well, we talked about how with the ulnar collateral ligament, of the thumb, its purpose is to keep the thumb stable when pinching. So if the ulnar collateral ligament is injured, you're going to lose the ability to pinch or hold an object by opposing the thumb. And as you can see from this example of picking up this water bead, this is going to be very difficult for somebody with a skier's thumb, or in more chronic cases, a gamekeeper's thumb. And typically with more chronic cases, Individuals are going to complain of weakness and pain, especially when using a pincer grasp, right? Because that ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb is injured. So how do we treat a skier's thumb? Well, we're going to use a hand-based thumb spike splint for two to four weeks, right? We're going to leave the IP joint free. We're also going to do some range of motion. So we can do some active range of motion, active assist range of motion, and then we'll begin some range of motion in flexion, extension, and radial abduction. And then eventually we'll move into palmar abduction and opposition. We can start to light key pinch exercises early, but in terms of strengthening the tip pinch and the thumb tip and all of these different loading exercises, we're going to have to hold up until we're medically cleared. Because if we start doing this too early, we might injure the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb again, and that's something we want to avoid. So we always want to talk to the physician and get the medical clearance from the physician before we begin any of these tougher strengthening exercises for a skier's thumb. And the second condition we're going to talk about is Decrovane's tenosynovitis. Before we continue to discuss our next condition, we're going to be talking about the different dorsal extensor compartments. So I have this picture on to the right about the six extensor dorsal compartments in your hand. And if you remember from our previous lectures, we discussed what nerve innervates the extensor muscles. And so the first dorsal extensor compartment is the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. The second dorsal extensor compartment is the extensor carpi radialis brevis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. The third dorsal extensor compartment is DPL, or known as the extensor pollicis longus. And the fourth is the extensor indicis propius and the extensor digitorum communis. The fifth is for the extensor digiti minimi, and the sixth is the extensor carpi ulnaris. And knowing the locations as well as the compartments and the different muscles that are involved are going to be especially important as we talk about this next condition. And so we're going to be talking about decrovanes tenosynovitis. So with decrovanes, it's going to be the first dorsal extensor compartment. And remember the two muscles that we talked about in the previous slide, we said it's going to be the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. And one of the common causes for decrovanes is repetitive stress injuries and sustained thumb abduction with ulnar deviation of the wrist can contribute to developing this condition. And some of the symptoms of decrovanes is pain and swelling near the base of the thumb and difficulty with moving the thumb and wrist when you're pinching or grasping an object. One of the tests we can use for decrovanes is 
called the Enkelstein's test. And I'll have a video eventually about all the different assessments we can use to provoke various symptoms and elicit positive responses for a variety of different conditions. So if that is something you're interested in, please let me know in the comments. So how does Decrovane's tenosynovitis affect occupational performance? Well, if we remember in the previous slide, we talked about how a person may have difficulty with pinching or grasping an object. So functionally, we're going to see difficulty with opening and closing jars, using scissors, swiping on your phone or typing, right? Because that first dorsal extensor compartment, right? And that thumb that's affected is a lot of pain, a lot of swelling. So as a result, you're going to have difficulty with swiping. People also have difficulty typing on the keyboard as well as playing the piano. So how do we treat decor veins? Well, the first treatment modality we can use is a forearm-based thumb spica with the IP joint free. We can also use different modalities. We can use an ice massage. We're going to definitely incorporate some activity and work modification, active range of motion, and eventual strengthening of the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis once the pain symptoms have subsided, right? Because we always want to incorporate pain-free exercises. And in terms of activity modification, we always want to minimize that ulnar deviation at the wrist and substitute the power of grip for pinch. And I found that one treatment technique that I've used that works is stretching the wrist as well as the thumb, uh, focusing on that abductor pollicis longus and that extensor pollicis brevis. And the third condition we're going to talk about is called Dupuytren's contracture. So Dupuytren's contracture is also known as Viking's disease. And that is because it is mostly found along Northern Europeans. And so Dupi trends, there are a couple of characteristics that are important to know. First is the nodules, and the second is the cords. And so with the first characteristic called the nodules, right, they're basically lumps that can be found under, under the skin in the palm of the hand. And so these nodules or lumps can feel tender and sore, but eventually the discomfort will go away. And with the second characteristic, which is the cords, they're basically nodules, but they thicken and contract, contributing to the formation of dense and tough cords of tissue underneath the skin. And so these cords can restrict the fingers and the thumb from straightening or from spreading apart. And so with dupe trends, as nodules under the skin thicken, which then form cords of tissue that pull the involved fingers towards flexion, right, into the palm. And so it's also important to know that with Dupuytren's, the fourth and fifth digits are oftenly the most affected. And so you're always going to see them go into a position of flexion, and it's just going to be nearly impossible to pull them out into extension because of the cords. And as you can see from this picture on the right, we can see the nodules on the cords, and the cords are pulling the finger into flexion. And so with how Dupuytren contracture affects occupational performance, well, we talked about how when the fourth and fifth digits are affected and they're gonna pull the, the ring finger and the pinky into flexion, right? It's going to be impossible to straighten it out. So in terms of function, we're going to have difficulty with picking up large objects, you know, placing their hands into their pockets in order to retrieve money, credit cards, ID cards, you know, wearing gloves, shaking hands, and everything that we do. And, you know, even holding a cup or a mug, right, while you're drinking that beer or that wine or coffee, whatever your guilty pleasure is. But with Dupi trends, we're going to have difficulty with doing all of that because, again, you're going to lose the ability to extend that fourth and fifth digits because it's just pulled into flexion because of the nodules and cords. And so what are some treatment techniques that we can use for dupe trends? Well, we can use a Z-plasty procedure or a McCash technique. And sometimes a dorsal orthotic may be preferred only because it may prevent breaking down of skin tissue to the surgical wound. And so if the release was performed on the fifth digit, we're going to incorporate 
the fourth and fifth digit in a hand-based orthotic. And if it's just the fourth digit, we're going to incorporate the third and the fifth digit because that's just comfortable, right? If you only incorporate the fourth digits, then the third and fifth digits may feel uncomfortable. And in terms of comfort, we're just going to splint all three. We can also do some range of motion. We're going to incorporate those tendon glides, which is going to be helpful for increasing the range of motion of the digits. All right, and usually after surgery, we're going to see tendon adhesions that occur. And so the tendon glides can be helpful at preventing or at least reducing these adhesions into the fingers. We also wanna talk to our clients about taking breaks. Eventually we'll do muscle strengthening after the physician gives the medical okay that we're allowed to. And then we're also gonna focus on edema control and we're also going to be focused on controlling that scar tissue, right? We want to try to minimize as much of the adhesions as we can. So we're going to be performing a scar massage or a variety of scar management techniques. And the fourth condition we're going to talk about is called the tennis elbow. Tennis elbow is also known as lateral epicondylitis. And if you guys remember from one of our previous lectures, we talked about the lateral epicondyle. It's the origin of the wrist extensors. And so with tennis elbow, the extensor carpi radialis brevis is going to be the most involved muscle, followed by extensor digitorum communis. And some of the symptoms we'll see with tennis elbow is just nighttime aching, morning stiffness on the outer part of the elbow. Gripping is going to provoke that pain sensation and grip strength will be reduced, especially when the elbow is extended and pain is just going to be worse with this position. And so how does tennis elbow affect occupational performance? Well, so in terms of function, a person is going to have difficulty with carrying a briefcase, hammering nails, picking up heavy buckets, opening doors, and they're going to be very tender when they're shaking hands. Again, these are some of the different activities people with tennis elbow may have. Obviously, it depends on the person and their daily activities and what they do. But if you can understand how the symptoms of tennis elbow or the different movements that elicit this pain and discomfort. And then you can understand how tennis elbow affects this person's occupational performance. And so how do we treat tennis elbow? First option we can use is a bowler wrist cock up splint with 35 degrees of extension. We're also going to use a soft forefinger buddy strap, which can relieve pain and promote active range of motion. We can also use a counter force brace and with the counter force brace, it's just going to transmit forces onto the muscle itself rather than on the location where the pain is. And then we're going to incorporate some activity modification. Eventually, we're going to progress from isometric to eccentric exercises. And then as we go from isometric to eccentric, we also want to make sure that we're doing this in pain free. And then finally, we can use some myofascial release and active range of motion to improve the range of motion and to decrease that pain. And finally, we're going to be talking about golfer's elbow. The golfer's elbow is also known as medial epicondylitis. And we talked about how the medial epicondyle is the origin of the wrist flexors as well as the pronator teres. And some of the symptoms we'll see with a golfer's elbow is just pain and tenderness on the inner side of the elbow, stiffness, weakness, and numbness or tingling in the ring and little fingers. And the reason why is because remember how in our previous lectures we talked about the ulnar nerve? Well, the ulnar nerve is located near the medial epicondyle, right? On the posterior aspect of the elbow, right where the cubital tunnel is located. And so the ulnar nerve just runs along right where the medial epicondyle is located. And so we're going to see that numbness or tingling in the ring and little fingers because of the ulnar nerve. And so how does golfer's elbow affect occupational performance? Well, depending on the person's daily occupations or different activities, you know, we might see them have difficulty with playing golf, cooking, chopping wood, or carrying a heavy suitcase. And again, these are some of the different activities the, this individual may have. It really just depends on them and what their daily activities are. 
And so how do we treat golfer's elbow? Well, we can use a bowler wrist cock up splint with the wrist neutral, and we can use the counter force brace. And again, the counter force brace is just going to transmit the forces onto the muscle itself rather than the location where the pain is. Again, we can use a soft four finger body strap and active range of motion as well as a myofascial release. And the myofascial release, again, is just to help alleviate that pain. And then we're going to use active range of motion to just increase the range of motion. And eventually we'll incorporate some muscle strengthening provided that it's going to be in pain free movements. And that is it for today. If you've liked this, please comment below. You can always see the PowerPoint on www.otvj.com as well as my YouTube channel, OTVJ, and our new Facebook group, OTVJ. In the future, I'll talk about more conditions. You know, we'll incorporate um, trigger fingers, uh, maybe different flex rate sensor protocols, maybe a video on all of the different special tests we can perform. Really anything, uh, if there's something in particular you want me to focus on, please comment below. And with that being said, I will see you guys next Sunday.